You know that family member? The one who tells stories on Thanksgiving and at get-togethers? The one who shares tales of misadventures from decades ago when there were no cell phones or social media and not even Google. For me, that's my mom, Molly. Around this magical time, she hosted a show called Romper Room and Friends. And a couple months ago, I realized that I'm the same age now that she was in the stories told from when she first started her career. I've heard these stories over and over again, but I'm not so sure I really listened. So by hearing them this time at the age of 22, I might be able to connect with her experiences a bit more. And I hope you do too. I'm Bridget, and this is Mirrored. Hello, and thanks for listening to Mirrored. Hello, that's my mom. We are so excited about this podcast, and since it's our first episode, I wanted to start by asking her about how she got her job on Romper Room. Way back when, back in the dark ages of television. Oh, gosh. (laughs) Well, that's the question I get asked most often. When people find out that I was one of the last Romper Room teachers, they always say, how did you get that job? Along with, why didn't you ever see me in the magic mirror? But that's another story for another day. But my answer is always that I was in the right place at the right time with apparently the right amount of talent. Apparently. And some training that helped as well. And people who really supported me along the way and guided me towards it. There were a lot of serendipitous moments that led me to Romper Room. There might be people out there who don't know what Romper Room is. Romper Room was a children's television show that started in the 1950s with Bert and Nancy Claster in Baltimore. And there's there's two stories. One is that there was a teacher's strike and there were children who were not going to be able to go to kindergarten or the kindergartens were too full and not enough kids could get in. I'm not so sure which story is right. They could use a Romper Room now. I guess they could. <laughs> So Romper Room was on the air from the 1950s until 1981 when it became Romper Room and Friends. And that's where this story begins. I was fortunate enough to study music theater at Carnegie Mellon University in Pittsburgh, and I was about to graduate and launch into the big bad world of entertainment. And our neighbor, Chris Romero, gave me a call. Christine was an actress, and I always looked up to her. And she married George Romero. Now, George Romero was a very famous director in Pittsburgh. He directed Night of the Living Dead and Dawn of the Dead. I had a little cameo in the beginning of that, which was a load of fun. Uh, He directed a movie called Martin that your grandma was in. (laughs) Anyway, Chris gives me a call one day, and she said, what are you going to do when you graduate? And I said, I'm going to do what you did, Chris. I'm going to move to New York. I'm going to audition. I'm going to find a job and see if I can find work. Isn't that what people who graduate with a degree in acting do? And she said, yes. She said, but I've got an idea for you. George is doing a movie this summer in Pittsburgh called Night Riders. And how about you come and be a production assistant on the film and we'll give you a little roll, enough to get you your SAG card. I mean, what a gift that was. I, That's so nice. It was amazing. I, it, it was, you know, kind and thoughtful and helpful. I mean, of course I said yes. And it was a load of fun that summer. And there were a lot of my friends who I graduated with who all got parts in the movie as well. That's so, so fun. It was, it was great fun to be able to spend the summer with my friends all learning how to film a movie. And on that movie, I did lots of different things. I was a makeup assistant. I had a role as the corn cook's woman, which was fun. I got to pluck a chicken in the middle of the night. (laughs) Blew my mind. And I also, as a production assistant, took the dailies back and forth to the airport. Those were the, you know, if they shot the film during the day and then it had to be shipped off somewhere to be developed and then sent back to be able to be viewed and they had to run back and forth to the day of the airport to have them put on a plane to go someplace else. And I schlepped water to the uh, stuntmen. 
and they because it was really hot. Joust on motorcycles. They jousted on motorcycles. And it's Bridget, ridiculous. think about it. There was no such thing as bottled water. So I couldn't just buy cases of bottled water to give to them. We had to fill jugs of water to give to them. I was trying to think the other day. I'm not so sure that those big Gatorade things were even available then. So I, I can remember carrying big buckets of water on it's my so hips to them. It's so funny because I'm just like, that sounds great. Like, even though it was hard for you. It was hot. <laughs> there were no water bottles. There, weren't, which, there were no uh, water bottles. Which is better bottles. for the environment. There was no such thing as a water bottle. They should have all brought their own water bottles. Or jugs, I guess. Well, I, you know, my memory's a little foggy, but I, I can remember that. <laughs> anyway. <laughs> so the summer ended. It was a great summer. It was wonderful. And the following spring... I came to New York for the opening of the film. And it was very exciting. It was red carpet and everything, then a theater in Times Square. And Times Square back then? Yes, Times Square back then. <laughs> what a lovely place Times Square was back then. <laughs> and Cynthia Adler, who was one of the actresses, she played Rocky in the movie. She's just an absolutely delightful person who was so kind to me. Let me stay in her apartment. And we went over to meet David Spangler. He had a studio, and he was a musician, and he was writing music, and she thought it would be really great for me to meet him. And we went over there, and he said to me, he goes, so what are you going to do? Which everybody asks, and you, you just graduated. What are you oh, going to do? Oh, I know. <laughs> <laughs> you do know that, don't you? And I said the same thing. I'm going to come to New York and audition and see if I can find a job. And I said, but someday I would love to own my own children's theater. I love children, and I love children's theater. And he said, oh. <gasps> you'd be perfect for Romper Room. And I looked at him and I said, is that still on? Because I had watched Romper Room as a child. I had watched Miss Janie growing up in Pittsburgh. And he said, yes. And in fact, they're making a new Romper Room and I'm writing the music for that. I'm going to call them and tell them about you. And, you know, I left thinking, yeah, like that's going to happen, really. And I had some things to do in New York that day, and my dad had set up an appointment for me to meet an agent. And, you know, back then, you know, there was no cell phone. There were no voicemail. There was really no way for anyone to get in touch with anyone. I'd gone back to the apartment, and the phone rang. And I answered it thinking that it was Cynthia, but it was actually David. And he said, they're in New York today, and I told them about you. Here's the number. Give them a call. So I did. Now, the, the odds of that, because I happened to get back to the apartment and the phone happened to ring. If I hadn't gone back to the apartment, it would never have happened. Right because, place, right time. Right place, right time. <laughs> so I called and they said, you know, we're here until 5 o'clock. If you can make it, we'll see you. If not, sorry. And I hung up the phone and I thought, I, you know, I'm never going to get this job. But... I had a teacher in college who said, don't ever, ever, ever turn down an audition because if you don't get that one, you never know what could happen next. So I brushed my hair, slapped some makeup on, got in a cab, and got down there in time. I was by uh, the American Museum of Natural History, and they were down on 57th Street. So fortunately, I got a cab, and I got there just as she was leaving. And Terry came out and looked at me. I can still see myself sitting on this little bench. And she came out and she goes, David says you're perfect. Why are you perfect? And I just spit out, well, I've, you know, I just graduated from college. I love children. I've got a degree in acting. I can improvise. I can sing. I can dance. Whatever you want me to do, I can do. <laughs> and she said, all right, if you can stay in town till next Tuesday, we'll see you. And that was it. So I went back to the apartment and I asked Cynthia if I could stay. And of course she said, I could. Mm -hmm. And while I was here, I had you know, resumes and headshots with me. So I went on another audition between then and Tuesday for the film version of Best Little Whorehouse in Texas. I was all excited thinking I was going to get that. And I got typed out. Tommy Toon came in and said, you, 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 stay. Everybody else, thank you. And I was in everybody else, thank you. <laughs> the following Tuesday, I go to the audition and I walk in and they had told me they wanted me to sing a song. And as I walked into the audition, they handed me a scarf and said, you're going to do something with this scarf. So I went, okay. I remember there were six people sitting on tall director's chairs, just kind of looking at me as I walked in the room. I had my guitar with me, and I sang The House at Pooh Corner, and then I took the scarf and I threw it up in the air and did something about a Martian. I, the audition was all improvisation. And then it ended. 
And they said, thank you very much. So then I got on the plane and went back to Pittsburgh. And I got a phone call from them. And they said, we'd like you to come back to New York for another audition, this time with children. And I thought, whoa, okay. Still thinking I'm not getting this thing, but I'll go back. But they also said to me, we need you to cut your hair a different style so that you look a little more wholesome. They took a picture of Lady Diana. And I thought, well, she's Lady Diana. She's wholesome. Took a picture <laughs> to the hairdresser and said, cut my hair like this. And they had told me to lose weight. So I lost seven pounds. That was the other part that was amazing is I, I was thin. There's, uh, there's more stories. There's more that. stories there with that. Yes. Of course. It so I got on People Express Airlines because back then you could get on the plane, give them $25, bring your lunch bag with you and pick a seat and fly to New York. And they would never have that today. No, they wouldn't have that today. It was like getting on a bus, only it was yeah, a plane. The bus in the air. The other thing I remember was we were in a, a studio, and I remember they were sitting on low chairs this time, not director's chairs. But <laughs> they had given me some things to do with the children, and I did. Jim Baffico had also said, this is the same teacher who had said never turn down an audition. He said, always do something that makes you stand out from somebody else if you get an opportunity. And I had been practicing magic and sleight of hand. And I did half the audition with the sponge ball in my hand. And then halfway through, I looked at a little girl and I said, oh, you got something behind your ear. And I did this little sponge ball routine. And I could see them out of the corner of my eye. Sally's jaw dropped. <laughs> and I thought, oh, this is a good sign. So she came up to me afterwards and was very, very kind and said, if I had my way, you'd be on the air Monday in New York. Wow. I didn't know that. Yeah, that, that kind of blew me away. And she said, but I'm not in charge. Go back to Pittsburgh. We'll call you. So I got back on the plane, went back to Pittsburgh, and they called. And they said, we've narrowed it down to two people, you and someone else. And we're going to fly you to Baltimore and do an entire half-hour show. And this was the first time that I really started to think, wow, I could get this job. So I arrive in Baltimore, and Terry took the competition and I out to dinner. So I'm <laughs> sitting across the table from the woman I'm going to be, you know, auditioning against. Was she nice? As I recall, she was. Yeah. I was too nervous to notice. That dinner, I'm sure, was part of the audition. Oh, that's true. You know. Oh, get, okay. Get to know me. What am I like? And that sort of thing. The biz, baby. The yeah. biz. <laughs> anyway, they gave us the outline of the show, and they taught me the song, Bend and Stretch. Uh -huh. And the most difficult part of the entire audition was the thing called a make it. <laughs> so we were going to make something that a child could put together in the back of a car on a long trip. They gave me a milk carton, a paper towel roll, yarn, safety scissors, glue, and I only had one of everything. So I went back to the hotel and I threw all this on the bed and I paced what the heck am I going to make? Plus, once I started cutting, I knew I didn't have anything else. It was also the first time I'd ever been alone in a hotel. It was kind of scary. It was a little scary. Yeah, so here I, I was that. in Baltimore in a hotel, and I finally figured it out. I made a little puppet with a smiley face on one side and a sad face on the other that they could spin around in the back. We did a whole half-hour show. I don't remember much about the audition itself. It was a blur. You know, it was an absolute blur. Oh, of course. But I do remember standing in the hallway and shaking everybody's hand as I left and thanking them and saying, you know, no matter what happened, I really appreciate this opportunity. So I flew back to Pittsburgh, and they told me they'd call me by the following Friday at 5 o'clock. That was a week away. That was a very <laughs> long week. Oh, I bet. Friday came, and my aunt and uncle were visiting. They all went out for the day and left me home alone because we didn't have answering machines. If I was going to get that phone call, I needed to be there. So I spent a whole day waiting for them to call. <laughs> so at 10 minutes till 5, she called. And she said, how would you like to be Miss Molly? And I said, would I like to be Miss Molly? Yes, I'd like to be Miss Molly. At which point the champagne cork popped in the kitchen because my dad was ready. So cute. And, well, you know your grandfather. That's, yeah. that's what he would do. And she said, if you'd like to be Miss Molly, please be in Baltimore Monday morning to start work. And I packed up 
everything I owned and put it in my Buick Regal on Mother's Day and drove out of the driveway to Baltimore. And when I look at you now and I think about that, I think, oh my gosh, my parents, my mother, I drove away on Mother's Day. But I was back six months later because we recorded in Baltimore from May until November. We recorded in Baltimore 100 episodes that were nationally syndicated. What syndication is, is they had the 100 episodes. So there were episodes that would be sent to different television stations all over the country. They had the big boxes of tape Mm -hmm. that they would mail to one station. So that station would air that episode and they'd pack it up and mail it to another station who would air that episode, who would then mail it to another station and air that episode. So those hundred episodes were then sent out to different television stations all over the country. And in fact, your grandparents could watch it in Pittsburgh, which they loved doing. That's so sweet. I bet they did. They did. But there was no streaming. (laughs) Definitely couldn't (laughs) stream it. And then I went back to Pittsburgh, spent several months in Pittsburgh doing other things, and they called and said, We'd like you to come to New York and be the teacher in New York. And that's when I came up and I met the folks from Channel 9. They had to approve of it, so I had to meet with them. And when I met Terry, you're not going to believe this. I don't know whether I ever told you this, Bridget, but we had lunch and we were discussing me being on Romper Room. I went back to the station. I was in her office and she had a glass coffee table. And there was a fly in the office. Oh, no. And I took a magazine and I whacked the fly to kill it and broke the table. (laughs) I saw that coming from a mile away. I broke the coffee table in a job interview. How much force did you use? In a job interview. And they still hired me. Why why did you hit the fly that hard? I often acted before I thought back then. Oh, gosh. But I wound up being Miss Molly for yeah. close to nine years after that. Mm-hmm. So you were you were Miss Molly until Richard was born? No, before uh, Charlie was born. In fact, they I thought, I thought the you day were still that on when Charlie was born. No, the day oh, that okay. I was going into the station to talk to them and let them know that I was expecting Charlie, the program director came up to me and he said, "I need to talk to you today," and I said, "I need to talk to you too." And he said, okay. So I went into his office and he said, you go first. And I said, no, you go first. (laughs) And he said, I'm sorry to tell you, but uh, we're going to cancel Romper Room. And I started to laugh. And he said, why are you laughing? I said, well, I'm expecting my first child. But they were good enough to say, hey, we don't want you to leave. We'd like you to stay here and continue working at Channel 9. And that's when the following spring I started doing A Plus for Kids Well, I think it's time to say goodbye to everybody and thank them for listening. But there's so much more to talk about. Then we have other episodes with more stories. I guess so. Thank you, Bridget. This was fun. Thanks for listening. It was fun. All right. Have a good day. Have a good day. Love you, friends. Love you, friends. (laughs) (laughs) To learn more and to support our podcast, visit mirroredpod.com. Or you can find us on social media as at mirroredpod. Mirrored is hosted and produced by Molly Barber and Bridget Barber. Our theme song is adapted from the original by David Spangler, music by Michael McGuire and Jacob Moore, and produced by Santiago Cardenas. Love you, friends. Have a good day.